Thank you everyone for joining. Good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast. Good afternoon to everyone, good morning to everyone on the West Coast. Um, let me start by saying that Well Health recently commissioned a study on the effect of the patient communication coordination process on clinical support staff and the results that we found are sobering. Today, we will talk to our guests from the renowned health system, UNC Health, about how they used a unified patient communication platform to overcome staff burnout and increase morale by implementing efficient workflows that led to a reduced workload. Please submit questions through the control panel in GoToWebinar. Today we have with us from UNC Health, Valer Elliott. She is a system, a healthcare system manager of access and clinical integration at UNC Health. Valer has over 10 years of experience in project management, network management, and scheduling and referral workflows. Her area of focus is utilizing technology to improve operational efficiency and access to care for patients. Tammy Jones is also joining us. She is the administrative support supervisor for several UNC healthcare outpatient clinics. She has worked at UNC Medical Center for 27 years and in management for 11 of those years. And from well is Meg Arano, a senior vice president, platform evangelist, and client success at Well. Before joining Well, Meg served as CEO for Adaris Health and Senior Research Director with Advisory Board's Information Tr Technology Strategy Council. Previously, she was Vice President and CIO for Boston Medical Center for more than a decade. And with that, I will hand the reins over to Meg. Thanks, TC. I appreciate that. And welcome to everybody. I'm so glad you could join us today. And especially, of course, welcome to Valer and Tammy. We're thrilled to have you with us. So let me start off by just doing a little bit of a context setting about the report that we did, the study we did. Uh, you'll see a link to that study available to, to everyone. Uh, we, we sponsored this study um, because we had heard so much, as I'm sure all of you have, about burnout in our clinical settings. And of course, most of that work has been focused on the direct caregivers, as it should be. Uh, and so we've heard a lot of those stories, but we were hearing less about the support team themselves. And we know that healthcare is a team sport, and we're happy to be teaming with many of you in that regard. But we're not the front line, uh, but, we, but we support front lines, and we wanted to know more about them. So, so we started out with this study. And Cece, why don't you take us to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about this study. So uh, we surveyed 320 frontline workers uh, who had communications as a significant part of their workload. Uh, these were folks that were in call centers or even uh, MAs or physician assistants that, that took patient communications as a significant part um, of their daily work. 88% of the respondents said that they had moderate or even severe or extreme burnout. And of those, of that category, 56% said that it was actually high or extreme. And while we knew everyone or we suspected that everyone would be feeling the stress of COVID and, and of the daily burden of that work, the 56% I think was surprising even to us and further, 82% believe that the patient communication process itself was a direct cause of their burnout. So whether or not they were doing this full time or doing it as part of their job, um, the communication piece itself seemed to be particularly burdensome to the staff that responded. We'll go on to the next slide, TC. So 96% of, of those that we surveyed said that they were still using phone-based communication as the primary method of communication. Uh, so we're drawing a bit of a corollary there to say that um, one place where we could consider uh, looking for mechanisms to ease the burden and the stress for these folks is to think about the tools that they're using, phone being the primary one, so what changes could we make to the way in which they're using the phone or perhaps substituting things other than the phone? I think that, TC, we've got a, a poll that we want to talk about at this point because we, to help us make sure that we're fully understanding our audience, uh, we'd like to hear from 
all of you um, if you're still using phone-based communication as your primary method. Um, and so take a moment, if you would, and uh, respond to that survey, and uh, we'll come back to it and share the results uh, in a moment. You can go on to the next slide while folks are filling out the poll, Tom. Oops. I'm still seeing the poll. I'm not sure if everybody else is also. There we go. All right. So uh, let's get on to the important part here. Let's get on to our stars of the day, our important guests. Uh, Valer, I'd like maybe turn to you first. Tell us a little bit about UNC so we can all kind of level set there. Um, and then after that introduction, maybe uh, talk to us a little bit about how you're handling patient communication. Yeah, sure. Um, so UNC Health, we're um, an academic medical system. Um, we're based in Chapel Hill, um, but we provide healthcare system or statewide across North Carolina. Um, we have 18 hospital campuses that um, provide care to North Carolinians from the mountains to the coast. Um, and it's just a great organization to work for. And so um, for our communication method, so until I've, I would say until the last 18 months, we were traditionally using telephone and the patient portal as our primary means of communication. We um, were partnered with a, with a vendor that could do one-way outgoing text messages for, for appointment reminders, but the functionality was really limited and we knew that our patient population was moving to a preferred communication method of text. Um, and we also know um, most of our patients are like me. I don't answer a phone number that I don't recognize, but I will read a text message from a phone number that I may not be familiar with. And so um, as an organization, we started thinking about what are some more effective ways that we can outreach to our patients. And that's how we um, landed with WELL because we knew with the two-way text messaging functionality that we would have a more effective way to communicate with our patients. Awesome, that's great. Thanks for the intro to that. And Tom, maybe this is the right time for us to share the results of our poll. All right, there we go. So 81% um, uh, still using phone as the primary method. So really right, right where you all started anyway at UNC and not um, dissimilar from what we see as we enter many of our customer sites, right? So often, um, while there may be some use of one-way appointment reminders in some practices at our customer locations, um, having the phone be the primary method of communication is, is still really common, although I, I'd say that's starting to change over time. Go on to the next slide. So um, that brings us to another part of the survey here. So which part of the patient communication process uh, was the staff finding most overwhelming? So 63% um, are spending at least three hours a day on the phone. Those are the folks that responded to our survey. And 82% reported frustration when communicating with the patient. Um, and more than, than half would say that that's just a, sort of a constant problem, a constant stressor. And not surprising, as you can see the number here, uh, many people felt that COVID-19 uh, made those frustrations even worse. Uh, we've heard from our customers often, uh, particularly as COVID was starting, uh, needing to move patients uh, to video visits, perhaps canceling elective surgeries, um, responding to patients' concern and worry um, about the safety, about the new processes, about the protocols. Um, all of those things, of course, added both volume, um, but also added stress uh, because the patients were stressed, right? So now we've got uh, staff that has more volume and patients that have more demands within each of those episodes of phone calls, right? So we can understand why the, the burden really shifted. And so I know that um, you had some specific goals, um, Valera, that you wanted to meet regarding phone calls and then even with the switch to text. Um, and we're going to I'm going to keep this now to what you were doing currently, and I know I know you expanded and you did some new things that we're going to talk about later, 
but let's let's start at the beginning. Let's start where we start about where your goals were and how you were doing uh, meeting those. And then, then Tammy, I want to bring you into this conversation because you're really in the thick of it. You and your team. Uh, it's one thing to set goals; it's another thing to meet goals, right? And so that that was really on your shoulders. So let's set the goals first, and then let's talk about how you were doing meeting them and what the effect on the team was. So yeah. Blair. And so, um, so our goal is for phone management. Um, we monitor phone service level. And so, you know, in good patient communication, you have to be able to have a conversation. And so we wanted to make sure that our staff could answer the phone within 30 seconds um, of, of a patient calling in. And so our goal is that 80% of phone calls coming into the clinic would be answered within 30 seconds of of that patient calling. So Tammy, was that realistic? How'd that work out for uh, you? Well, in the beginning, um, we kind of held on okay. And then um, with COVID coming along and all the uh, the abundance of the calls coming in, it was not, it was not doable for the team. Um, we had more calls coming in that we had people that can answer because a lot of the times the patients had a lot of questions, you know, is this going to be an in-person visit? Is this going to be a virtual visit? And the conversation kept was much longer, and then we ended up with more calls in queue and calls that we missed and questions that weren't answered. And this was the only form of communication that we had. This And um, we have a MyChart system through Epic, but a lot of times patients wanted to talk to someone to make sure their questions got answered. So at some point, a lot of the times, we were not meeting these goals. So talk a little bit, Tammy, about the, how your staff responded to that. Like what, um, we've heard about the stress through the survey, but you lived it. What were you seeing day to day? Yes, our, our staff was very um, short-tempered um, with each other, with the patients. They felt like they couldn't accommodate all the needs of all of everything that we were asking of them. Patients I get, was getting a lot of patient complaints, um, felt like pay, pay, the staff was not hearing them. And a lot of times patients just want to be heard. And because it shows up how many calls we have in queue, they felt like they needed to rush through that call to get another call, to get all the calls taken care of. Um, it was very stressful for them. We had um, more call outs, more people taking more vacation because they felt like they needed a break and they were not happy um, in their day to day working with us at our um, rheumatology clinic. I have to say, Tim, I think you're, you're telling a story that I'm guessing is going to really hit home and be familiar to most of the people listening to, to this webinar. I certainly heard that from other customers' versions of that. And, and uh, I think we under appreciated perhaps when we were in the thick of it, and I mean sort of all of us sort of culturally, um, what was happening to everybody in those moments, uh, both on the staff side and on the patient side, right? Those were those were shared moments of stress, unfortunately, and, and that's always going to take its toll on, on both what people are feeling, but also the effective work that we can all do together, the staff and the patients. So uh, I appreciate that you're sharing that. Go on to the next slide, TC. So, uh, just to drive that home, I guess we'll say, right? 63% of the clinical support staff reported that they'd considered quitting or switching jobs. Um, I know, like me, everyone listening is hearing what's happening in the labor market right now. So, and how difficult it is. Uh, to recruit new staff and to retain staff and, and actually making retention all that more important. So many people are um, leaving their jobs, not just in healthcare, but across all sectors. Um, this idea of creating situations that lend themselves more to turnover during a time when we're really fighting for retention uh, has affected, I think, every health system in the country. And I think that these jobs um, the, the kinds of jobs that we're talking about here, I, I think, have seen even disproportionately more turnover than some of the other jobs within healthcare. Um, 88%, though, if there's a light in, at the end of this tunnel, right, said 88% said that it would help if patient communications 
were automated in some way, if their tools were better, if there was some sort of template that could be used. So to, that speaks directly to the idea of really helping our teams manage the volume that they're trying to deal with, right? And making sure that those conversations or that information that can be shared effectively through automated or tool-based needs uh, can be executed in that way that frees up the staff to deal with only with those interactions that really require the human touch and the human intervention. Um, we stole a phrase here at Well, we stole a phrase from all of our customer uh, healthcare organizations about working at the top of our licenses, right? We all hear that about clinicians, but it's true probably for our support teams as well, right? Let's reserve their energy and all of the work that they're doing for those places where the human touch is really very important and vital to making sure that we're meeting the needs of those patients. I think that's, you know, if we dig deeper um, into the survey results and have shared these results with our customers, um, that's really what they're talking about. They're not trying to automate 100% of things. They're trying to automate those things that make sense, that reserve their human capital for places where it can really add value. So um, I think that that's part of what you've achieved. Um, so if you can talk a little bit more about uh, what you were able to achieve when you implemented well, that's, I think that's a good jumping off point for the next part of our conversation. I'm going to throw that first to Valere. Okay. All right. Thank you, Meg. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so with us, so Tammy reached out in, um, I want to say talking in December of last year and was interested. So we were piloting well two-way text messaging and thinking about how we wanted to spread this across the system. And um, and she was just really enthusiastic to get this with her and her team. And so we were able to get them live on this functionality in, in January. And, um, and with that, what we saw is, you know, there was... A, an almost immediate increase in in phone service level and and it's been phenomenal you know Tammy's team has been able to to get back up to to consistently meeting goal routinely staying within 96 to 100 percent of phone calls answered within 30 seconds and and that's just really impressive that's very difficult to do um and and one of the other things that we noticed was you know Meg as you mentioned you know, how can we automate outreach? How can we make it easier? And so when we gave this tool to the to the rheumatology group, their incoming calls decreased because they were able to have more effective communication through text message. And so we've consistently seen um, the number of incoming calls decrease by about 30%. And, and both of those changes um, took place pretty instantaneously about a month after we implemented the well functionality. And they have just continued to, to stay phone service level going up and incoming calls moving down. So Tammy? Is she telling the truth? Absolutely. And with those that number change, the staff had the stress level, they're they're much better. They're happier at what they're doing because they're able to complete their tasks. And we every time that we have a meeting about our metrics, I'm always sharing how well things are going and they feel it. They have the time to take care of the patients with the two-way texting because they can have a whole schedule, a whole appointment and never pick up the phone. Um, patients love that because it's at the, their, their capacity when they can do it. Instead of just I, like Valer um, related to earlier about answering an unknown number, um, they will see that text and they said, oh, I got, this is about an appointment. Yeah, I'll do it. Even to confirming their appointments, we have even less missed appointments because of patients confirming and not making an error from the way we had it before. They confirm, we go on through, and it's, it's been a win for UNC, especially for rheumatology clinics. Yeah, that's great. And, and two things that you, that you mentioned worth sort of calling out. So the typical well implementation uh, uses your own, the customer's own phone number, not a short code, right? I think we've all had this experience of getting 
these texts from these five digit codes that we don't know what they are. Mine are usually political in some way, so I definitely go right by them. But whatever, wherever they're coming from, but these are numbers that you're, as you said, your patients know this is UNC calling. So, so it really helps in terms of the responsiveness and the interaction. So thanks for calling that out. I appreciate that. But, um, I think it's an important thing for us to, to pay attention to. And it's, it's great to know that also that it's, it has that sort of lingering effect of reducing the incoming calls as well, which I know can, can be super stressful for the team when it's that sort of constant phone ringing, constant putting people on hold kind of thing. So great to hear those things. Why don't you go on to the next slide, TC? Oh, poll question. Hop poll. Does your staff requested automation, automated patient communication tools? Take a minute, if you would, to let us know about that. It's an interesting thing uh, that we have been discovering is that it's actually um, sometimes the um, workforce, the folks that are actually engaged in the communication that are bringing this to management. So not necessarily a top-down kind of strategic decision all the time, but sometimes also a bottom-up bottom kind, of, kind of request. So uh, take a minute to answer this poll and uh, we will later uh, share the results with you. Go on to the next slide in the meantime, TC. Okay, here we go. UNC Rheumatology Department. We've talked about this a lot in our preparation calls, uh, getting ready for this right now. So uh, without further ado, I know that you guys have some, some great results to share with us about the, the Rheumatology Department. Uh, Valeria, you want to kick it off and then we'll hear from Tammy too. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, um, so referral workflows are are near and dear to to my heart. Um, and so, you know, referral conversion rate is the ability to convert a referral into a scheduled appointment because, as we all know, um, a referral is only get, as good as the appointment that it creates. And so, our goal for referral conversion rate is that eighty five percent of referrals will be converted to an appointment within 21 days of, of that referral being placed. And, and when we only had the phone as our communication tool, that was a difficult goal to, to meet because with an increased number of referrals coming in, that means you have to make more outbound calls and you've got more incoming calls coming in. So it's, you know, it's like a competition to, to see who can answer and who can get someone on the phone. Um, what we've seen, and um, I was saying earlier, it's probably the most beautiful run chart that I've, that I've ever seen, is a significant increase. Um, and I would actually say the, the improvement, I just recrunched the numbers, it's now, um, it's now significantly higher. So um, we're seeing about a 45% improvement rate in referral conversion. And so the rheumatology group has been consistently hitting that 85% mark or, or higher for the last few months. And, um, and it's just really nice to see. And What's for it been like group, from your perspective, Tammy? Yes, and for our group, it's much easier because they're reaching the patients when they're able to schedule instead of making just a bunch of annoying phone calls. And people add work. They have other things to do. And they reach us. And like I said earlier, sometimes we can even schedule with the two-way texting and the patient never, it never interrupts their day. And my staff can move on to the next patient. We're reaching patients a whole lot quicker um, and easier. So it's moving the numbers right up the chart, and we're really excited about this. They are very excited about the increase in their metrics. And actually, for them, the work is so much easier. Yeah. And if I can add one more thing, um, one really beautiful thing about this run chart is, um, you know, we've consistently seen our referral volumes increase. And so, you know, earlier in the pandemic, Patients were nervous. We saw a lot of delayed, um, a lot of delayed care needs, and so we have this pent up demand, and we're now trying to get patients in as quickly as possible. And so I just really want to highlight the good work that Tammy's team has done. They have higher metrics, 
with an increased number of referrals. And again, typically those are two things that would, you know, more work typically um, can decrease how, how you're performing, but Tammy's team is continuing to knock it out of the park. And one thing to add with the same amount of staff, yes. we didn't increase our staff. So it's great. And I love to see the pride. All right, all right, I love this. So, you know, the study is all about burnout, but look at the look at the tangential effect that we've had here, right? So when you can get a win-win-win like this, so we've got staff who feel less stressed, we've got a happy provider organization that is uh, doing good things in terms of their volume and revenue, I would assume. We've got happy doctors that are filling their slots effectively. We got patients getting really good care, so it, I have uh, I can understand uh, why you were as proud as you are about these results. It's re it's very impressive. So and it must feel great for the team, Tammy. Right? I mean, who doesn't love to win? It sounds like it really sounds great. It is. They are very proud of themselves. Awesome, as they should be. You see, we have any uh, poll results? We do have poll results, and I was just thinking about how we're going to need to update this 30% to a 45% after this uh, <laughs> wraps up. Let me share these results with you. All right, regarding staff requesting automated tools. So we've got staff reaching out uh, with ideas. That's what, that's, that's what this tells me. 77% are saying uh, it's true. Staff, staff are looking for these kind of tools. So um, I think it is becoming uh, you know, more well known that these kind of tools uh, exist, that they're within reach and that they can can make a difference. And I think that folks are trying to, to do some of their own um, problem solving. Uh, one slide that we don't have in the deck that I want to cover because it is in the study, and you'll see that when you download the study, is that the, the other heartening part of this is that um, of the folks that we surveyed who expressed that they had reached out to management um, about their stress, that they were that they were open about the fact that they were feeling burdened and somewhat burnt out. Uh, there was a high percent of folks that said, you know what, my and my management listened. My management really heard about my stress and they really worked with me to try to do it, as as we can see is true at UNC. But it also seems to have been the majority of our respondents to the survey, which uh, was also really great news to us, um, whether it's well or other tools. Um, the idea that people are feeling free uh, to voice this and to look for solutions, I think overall uh, will help healthcare in general and our, and our team specifically, right? Our healthcare team, so awesome to hear. So we've talked a lot about the um, about staff burnout because uh, that was our focus, uh, but there is a, another related uh, experience that we need to at least raise, which is all of this uh, happens in concert uh, with the care that we are delivering to our patients and the value that we're bringing to patients. And of course, everything that happens at your organization is about driving health, is about improving the health and the experience of patients. And this burnout that we've taken as our focus um, also has an effect uh, on our patients. See, I'm not sure if it's just my screen where the, uh, the slide has changed a little bit, but I'm, I'll keep talking. Maybe it's just my slide. If you all can still see the slide, whoop, there we go. Uh, we've got 60, whoo, <laughs> we've got 63% um, who say, yeah, I'm stressed and the patients know it. And I think we've all had those kinds of interactions, whether it's with our healthcare organizations or elsewhere, right? We can tell when we're on the phone with somebody who's not having their best day. Um, so uh, our respondents were honest and they said, yep, the patients do notice. Uh, further, 58% believe that their burnout has negatively affected a patient's quality of care, right? So through that interaction, through that stressed interaction, whether it's that patients are hurrying to get off the phone because they're empathy and they're feeling like they're sort of bothering the person on the other end of the phone, whether or not they don't have the patience to actually hang on, 
while a uh, while someone on the phone is juggling multiple calls at one time, maybe, and so they get sort of tired of of being of the um, responder being uh, distracted in some way. There are myriad ways in which um, this the stress level uh, turns into things that affect the patient's ability to ultimately accomplish the task that the communication was intended to um, resolve. 60% report that the uh, poor or ineffective patient communication um, actually would go as far as having affected a patient's health outcome. Um, we don't have the details on that. We are surmising that that is probably about missed appointments um, or, or missed follow-ups. Um, so we can see that the, the burden that we're talking about um, you know, has unintended consequences um, that really affect the mission of our healthcare organizations uh, at its core. Um, Tammy, I'm going to go to you and ask if if any of that rings true to you. I don't want you. I don't want to put you on the spot that much, but I think I want to ask. It seems like it seems like that is a ubiquitous issue. Uh, it makes sense to me that it would be, um, but I'm just curious about maybe specific uh, situations that you can relate to. Absolutely, um, Meg. We've had a decrease in, I am the person that when patients are upset, they're coming to me. And in the midst, probably six, eight months ago, it was like every day there was a complaint of, you know, the person was short with me. I don't think they heard me. They're not listening to me. And in rheumatology, we have a lot of patients that are in pain and they need a lot of uh, care on that it was starting with that phone call. And um, and now with the well texting and now that our phone, our incoming volume has decreased, we are able to take that time with the patient. And I may get a complaint once a month and sometimes no months at all um, with the change in how we've taken care of not only the staff, the patients and the providers and giving them the ability to use a two-way texting in order to communicate when they have their time and when they need to. And UNC has set a standard. We have 30 minutes to respond to a two-way text, and it feels like the patient is being heard, and they need to, for us to call them. Then at that moment, we stop and make that phone call if it's something that we can't handle with the two-way texting. So things are definitely improving, and with our patient satisfaction, is also in, improving. That's great. Thanks, Tammy. I, you know, I'm curious about that, um, the 30-minute threshold. So I'm going to, I'll throw a surprise question at you. We didn't quite talk about before, but I know you're up for it. So when we've worked with, um, <laughs> there you go. When we've worked with uh, other customers, um, it's been interesting to me that as they move from phone support to texting support, having to change that response threshold, we've actually worked with some customers who had initially with the phone support had thresholds of saying, we'd like you to return calls the next day, so within 24 hours. And then when they moved to text, they continued for a while to say, oh, it's a 24-hour threshold. And, and we've had to have those conversations to say, well, how would you feel if you texted your family member to pick up groceries and they didn't, you know, they decided not to answer you until the, until the next day, right? So it does create a, a tighter window in terms of consumer expectation, right? But it sounds like that's something you've successfully managed. Was that difficult for your team? Absolutely not. The whale has set up where we get a little flash at the end, at the bottom of our screen that comes up and lets us know that somebody has responded in the whale platform. So they just click on it, answer it, and go right back to what they're doing. You would be surprised that at once we got used to, you know, everything with change, you got to get used to it and get your 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 change your how your flow is going but once they get into the flow is as, as soon as most of the time as soon as something pops up someone is in it they take turns doing certain tasks but someone is always in well and the first thing we do in the morning is check well because patients will text over the night something has come up and they need an answer to something or they'll confirm an appointment whatever whatever the need of the patient is and those um 
requests are taken care of first thing in the morning. So it has it is not truly hard to meet that 30 minute window. That's great. So it's it sounds like um it sounds like you you're increasing your responsiveness while you're still reducing your staff burden, which is which is awesome and and also you kind of snuck in there another point which is that your patients are able to contact you via this this text message uh at their convenience. You know, if if they're up at midnight uh walking the floor with with a a baby they can uh, they can take a moment and they can drop you a text and you're picking it up the next morning. So and we have certainly heard uh, from uh, from other customers that their patients appreciate the flexibility of being able to do a text in the middle of the workday or you know in the evening when they finally you know get a chance to sit down, etc. So call that out too. Thanks for sharing that. And and Meg, if I could just add a little bit, another benefit, you know, when phone is your only communication attempt it's it's really one shot to get that person on the phone but with text message um with our patients but also with our friends you know it's just it can be a continuous flow so if i'm you know up doing something late at night and something pops in my head i can send a text message and and i know they're probably not going to respond late at night but they can get back to me the next day and it just it's a seamless conversation that you can carry on throughout. So it's just so much more powerful. Um, and in my opinion, it's the best communication platform. Great, great. Tom, you wanna to take us to the next slide, please? 82% report appointments that are missed every, are missed every week uh, due to miscommunication. So again, staying with that theme of what we're doing in our call centers and in our front offices has a direct effect on patient care and on health outcomes, right? Missed appointments, we can say, will certainly track to some sort of impact on health outcomes. And you can, I won't read the slide, you can see the numbers here about how often uh, we think that that may be happening. And um, Again, on the burden side, I'll say, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about, but I know you, that everyone listening knows all too well, missed appointments and uh, less than optimal slot utilization uh, is something we talk about all the time uh, with the caregivers and, and with the administrative teams uh, at our customer space. So missed appointments are just, as we know, just kind of bad all the way around. And one of the things, uh, Tammy, that we've talked about in the past is that the other thing that that text messaging does that the phone calls unfortunately don't do uh, is it gives the patient um, a preserved record of the conversation or of the appointment reminder. It's still on my phone. I can, I can reference, I can go back to it if I need to go back to it. Um, and so we think that we're having also perhaps a tangential effect on that missed appointment. Is that is that, do you think that your patients are keeping those messages? Do you ever hear about that? Or do you think that those messages get lost in the shuffle? I'm not, we don't really hear whether they keep the messages or not, but it is a more effective way of confirming and keeping those appointments. We did have another um, form of, of uh, patient reminders that was sent out and, and it was through the phone. And sometimes patients would con get confused because one could be no and two could be yes, and they'd mix it up and they'd cancel an appointment and then show up. And since we've been doing it through well text, it once they confirm they've got it, it gives them their information. We have a clear cut record of it. We can go right back to that patient. We don't have to do a lot of searching. It's right there for us. And we have really stopped having those issues. That's great. Great to hear. Yep, just just another, as we said, sort of tangential benefit, right, of, of moving things in this direction. All right, Tom, I think we got one more slide, if I'm remembering correctly. All right, not seeing the slide change. I'm gonna go right ahead and I'm gonna keep going. So Valer, tell me a little bit about what it is uh, you're thinking about uh, next. So now you've got a tool, uh, you got the creative juices going about the ways you may want to use the tool. Uh, what's next? 
Do you know? Yeah, so we um we we have a list. We work with your project team on a on a weekly basis to to implement each of these items. And so um one of the things you touched on was how we can automate communications and and that is something that that we want to do where it's appropriate to automate we want to do that and so we're looking at your chat assist ai tool um, as we have um, moved more into virtual care we want to leverage that automated outreach to help patients make sure that they're prepared for their virtual visit um, the tool can you know, talk them through step one, two, and three. Here's how you get set up for your visit and quickly take them through some troubleshooting techniques. And it's just a really nice way that we've built that script out. Um, we're looking at self rescheduling. And so, you know, right now when a patient cancels their appointment, um, we're still working with our staff and, and they work with the patient to reschedule that. But if we could put that in the hands of the patient to go ahead and reschedule their own appointment, um, it does two really powerful things. One, it lets us know you're unable to be there. But two, it allows the patient to go ahead and reschedule that appointment in a time more convenient for them. And, and three, without our staff having to do anything. Um, and then another couple of things that we wanna do. So we wanna continue building on our improved referrals outreach. And so we wanna think about ways that we can um, automate that outreach even more. And so just make it easier for patients to know you have a referral with us and we wanna get you scheduled. And then lastly, we want to continue to improve on our, our appointment reminder outreach. It's so critical that we get patients to the right time, um, right appointment, right time, right place. And so we're looking at refining our appointment reminder cadence um, and actually learn this from another well customer with a with the cadence that they had that saw decreased no shows. And we're going to work to to implement that at UNC. Great, thank you for sharing. So uh, let me uh, let me just circle back on a few things that you mentioned. So Chat Assist AI uh, from Well, for those listeners who maybe do not know, uh, is the a new feature that we have been uh, working on uh, for quite some time that we are rolling out that will handle more complex conversations, has deeper decision tree guided conversations, uh, for richer patient communications, again, without needing to um, involve your staff in many in many cases. Uh, we are, um, actually piloted that with the COVID vaccine workflows that allowed, at, just as a for instance, allowed an, a fully automated interaction uh, for patients to work with their provider organizations about uh, getting the flu vaccine. Uh, and or the booster, uh, being able to decline that, but also through that declination uh, allowed for the providers to get further information about why that was. Again, none, all of this was fully automated, no staff intervention, but we could understand whether a patient had already received the vaccine or booster, could understand if they wanted more information or if they preferred to go elsewhere for it. Etc. So uh, deeper, more complex uh, decision trees that get to more meaningful conversations. Uh, self rescheduling, also a feature that uh, Valer mentioned that we're working on. And uh, lastly, I'll say um, Valer um, and, and UNC generally has been participating uh, in our small group affinity conversations that we've just been spinning off so that our customers can speak with one another, uh, speak with similarly situated. Uh, organizations and share best practices uh, and so we've, we've just uh, spun those up but we're very excited about that they've been really uh, engaged in animated conversations uh, we're just listeners we well are just listeners in those conversations uh, but it's just been great to hear and there's a lot of um, sharing that's happening and a lot of best practices that are, are coming out of those conversations so thanks Laura we look forward to continuing to partner with UNC, you guys have been just great for us to work with. So, so much fun and uh, just fun to be doing doing good, doing doing good and doing well, as they say. So thank you for that. Uh, that, I believe, ends our, um, our slide presentation. Uh, we wanna hang out for a little bit longer uh, with those of you who are listening and take some questions and uh, we'll be as candid as we can be in answering them. I think most of the answers have come from Valer and Tammy, and uh, I'll fill in around the edges where I can.
Sam, what do we got? Thank you, Meg. Yeah, we've got a, a couple of great questions in the uh, control panel. For those of you who are still curious, you can still pop in your questions there. Um, I'll ask one here. This, this I think we might have a couple of different perspectives from both uh, Tammy and Valer. Um, this is someone who's probably got an automation system and wants to know your secret sauce. So what are the key components in successful workflows for better patient care and staff communication? Um, so one of the things that, that we think about from a technical build perspective is how are we structuring the platform to, to meet our, our operational needs? And then from an operational perspective, we want to think about um, key things. So ideally, first contact resolution. So how can we meet a customer need the first time that they communicate with us? Um, and then secondly, how can we automate our, you know, conversations and, and outreach attempts? So we do want a, a communication style that feels very personal to our patients. But we know, as Tammy mentioned earlier, their work volume has grown, but their staff levels haven't grown. So how can we give them tools that make it easier for them to do their job? And what can we automate so that they can really focus on um, on that core work, what what can we make easier for them? And I think from the um, the staff standpoint, once you get the buy-in, and we had several meetings about well before we even did the training. I I I gave them what was given to me and how great this would be for them, but I also listened to them and how they felt it would affect them. And we met at a good place in the middle. Valera and her team did a wonderful job training us. Um, if they had questions, um, they were right there to answer them. They had uh, like reviews before even before even getting started. Once they got started, they could get into other trainings. But that team, they owned it and they ran with it. This next question, um, I'm gonna combine a couple and see if it makes sense here. So uh, the question is, how do you tackle responding to patients that enter unrecognized responses? And uh, what sort of guardrails do you put in to sort of limit the amount of unrec unrecognized texts? So, um, so I don't know that we necessarily have have guardrails coming in. Um, and so all, all of our appointment phone numbers at UNC are, are text enabled. And so similar with how it works on our mobile phones, any, anyone who wants to try and outreach to us can. Um, we do training. So what we've tried to do is, is work with our staff to understand, you know, um, when this platform is the best is the best communication tool um when there are certain conversations that may be more appropriate and in, in another channel um and and just really um thinking through that so we try to address it more through through our training than through anything that we've done with um with the technical build Here's i'll question. just jump in through there i'm sorry tc let me just jump in a little just to make sure because i know we've got a mix of folks um, that are listening in, some of whom are more or less um, familiar with WELL. So I will say that um, WELL uses natural language understanding um, in many of our workflows. So to be able to understand that, um, and we continue to enhance that, particularly as we roll out Chat Assist AI, um, so that we'll be able to understand that uh, yes, yep, and okay, uh, depending on the context, may mean the same thing. So we're we're recognizing some of those responses if they are free form. If you haven't set it up by you know yes or no, you know text Y or text N, if there's something we don't know. And the other is is that we do have um, an ability for things that are not recognized to um, shell that out to a staff member specifically. So if, if a patient responds with something that they don't understand or responds that they want more information, uh, we can configure the system so that that goes into a staff member's queue to answer directly. I have a couple of questions from someone who I just assume is not a customer yet of Well around sort of getting off and running. So 
this was a question around how long after implementation did it take your system to run smoothly with well and there were also questions uh, related to what was your call volume before and after and how many people does it sort of take um, to run both the the well and the, uh, the call center um Good questions. I don't know that we will have all the specific answers to to those questions right um, right off the top. So um, we began having conversations with Well in I think January of of 2020, and so we implemented we've we've done a phased approach. So our first goal was um, we wanted to do a a rip and replace. So um, we implemented well for all of our um, appointment reminder communication, recalls communication, um, automated referrals outreach, as well as no shows communication. Um, it took us about six months of meetings and technical build before we had that up and implemented. And that was a very smooth transition. Um, and so that was just seamless. It was really behind the scenes with the technical team. And then we did good training and communication so that our, um, our operational members knew that we had a new platform with, with new functionality. Um, for the two-way text messaging, so um, at UNC, we like to do a process where we pilot functionality first. And so we piloted this across several areas for about a year and once we had a successful pilot and and knew that we were going to have the approval of senior leadership we've been in the process of spreading this two-way text messaging um, and when we really did kick off for implementation it's taken us about six months um, to to outreach and spread this across the healthcare system um, and so i do not have the typical call volumes or or staffing um, numbers for our entire system off the top of my head. Um, and so I don't know, Tammy, if you know those those specific metrics for your group or if that's something we'd we'd have to look up. Um, we would be happy, TC, if you'll um, if you want to share that information with us after, we'd be happy to follow up with that person. Thank you for that generous offer. I think we'll have to take you up there. Are several questions. Uh, that we won't have time to get to. And I'm very much looking forward to either putting them in touch with you um, or someone from our team. So if you've submitted a question and we weren't able to answer it in the time that we had today, don't be surprised if someone from Well reaches out to continue the conversation. And I want to thank our guests for joining us today. Um, Belair, Tammy, really appreciate the stories that you shared with us. I'm very happy that you were able to have a successful outcome with Well so far and that it's so important to your future patient communication plans. Uh, for those of you who are on the website uh, webinar now, you'll receive an email with a link so that you can watch a recording of it. And feel free to follow up with us with questions over email or phone. And want to thank you for participating today and look forward to additional webinars coming out in the future.